Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 125, Podcasting for PhD Students. Now, this is a, a fun, weird and quite exciting session for me to deliver. I'm actually at my kitchen table because I needed a bit of space for kit, including a funnel, but more of the funnel later. This is a really surprising and exciting vlog for me to deliver. Some of you may know I'm one of the earliest academic podcasters on the planet. It's something that I research, it's something that I use in my research and also use in my teaching. But these days and my sort of leadership roles that I've done in the last decade or so, I tend to sort of just do podcasting and not talk about it a great deal. I use my skill set and my kit to enable other people's career. So podcasting clearly is part of a public intellectual function and let's hope it's also part of an organic intellectual function. But this vlog is surprising and it, it comes via the session, the interview, that I did with the wonderful Philippa Grand at Emerald Publishing in Yorkshire. And I was happily talking with her about something else. I think I was talking with her about audiobooks and the diversity of publishing that exists right now. And all of a sudden, she came out with the, oh, podcasting is transforming academic publishing. And you can see the surprise on my face because I wasn't even going to talk about that. And yet for Philippa, the podcasts are really mattering to academic publishing. And I researched since I came back from the United Kingdom a little bit about the most current, most accurate material on podcasting that's been released in the last three, four months on academic publishing. And look, the results even surprised me. So I think it is timely and really exciting that we actually talk about podcasting for you. And podcasting <laughs> has often been the sort of unpopular child, the runt of the litter in social media. You know, we're a very tight community, we support each other, we've developed this thing called podcasting, but we're sort of geeks together and we were sort of a bit unpopular. It's like all Twitter, all Facebook, all Instagram, and then there's those weird podcasters over there playing with Kit. We better leave them alone. But in the last five years, podcasting is clearly no longer the runt of the litter. And I think probably that great podcast serial started to transform everything in the last two years. It became part of popular culture. People gained a demand, and I would also argue a sonic literacy for high quality non-fiction content. So it's no surprise that all of a sudden academic podcasting has become a thing. Who knew this was a thing? Well, this is a thing. And look, I should have known this. You know, the surprise that I had in response to Philippa's interview was a bit bonkers, really, because I should have known this. When Steve and I recorded our University of Trumpland podcast in the January of 2016, as Trump had just been inaugurated as president, we recorded that podcast. I think we did it on a Saturday. In fact, we did it just over there. We did a lot of our podcasts in this area. And we'd recorded it on the Saturday. I edited it up and uh, sent it up to my podcatcher. And I sort of, as I always do on Sunday morning, had a look at the downloads from the podcast overnight and this thing had gone absolutely bonkers like we always have thousands of downloads for which we are always incredibly grateful but this one had gone to tens of thousands of downloads incredibly quickly and like I even brought Steve in on the Sunday morning to say am I misreading those download figures right so clearly I should have known something was happening and look we did because we went well we're saying something that is of interest there so the book Trump studies in some ways came from the success of that podcast and also I realized something else as I was on the train from Yorkshire down to Manchester Airport thinking about that interview with Philippa and suddenly some pennies dropped for me because after Steve's death you know, thousands of people around the world sent me letters and emails and cards and flowers and thank you all to everyone for that. That was fantastic and remarkable. And, you know, these people had been taught by Steve, supervised by Steve, had read his books. But something odd happened and I didn't really understand it at the time. But the people who were most desolate, who just couldn't actually get over the fact that Steve had gone, 
were our podcast listeners and they were writing me page upon page upon page of an email. Long letters from all around the world arrived at the Office of Graduate Research and they were our podcast listeners. And there was a level of intimacy there that came as a surprise to me. And can I say, how fantastic is it that a 66-year-old distinguished international academic had his most outstanding out there fans via podcasting? And Steve, can I say, would have loved that. But that story, that pennies drop moment is important to what we're talking about today. Because podcasting creates a connection. And that connection is of interest to me today. So let's talk about why podcasting matters. And let's firstly have a little bit of a chat about Sonic Media. Most of you know one of my night jobs is as a researcher of Sonic Media. I teach this stuff. Now, Sonic Media matters because it's not visual. It is literally not in your face. It can be downloaded, Sonic Media can be downloaded to nest into your life to nestle into your everyday life. You can listen to podcasts while you're doing your commute in the morning, while you're exercising, while you're walking. In the old days, we used to refer to media like podcasting as secondary media. You're doing something else and this secondary media weaves through your life. So sound only, sonic media are really important because you can listen to it, listen to high quality content while you're doing something else. And therefore that's incredibly important for you as PhD students and academics more generally that are developing that author platform. Because this is an intimate medium. You are whispering into somebody's ear. That's what podcasts are and they're allowing you to be a part of their life. So you're not imposing the media on them. They're incorporating it gently and delicately into the patterns of their daily life. So that's why the connection to podcasters and our listeners is so tight and precise. There is that connection through sound that it is actually not video. Now, I'm not against video at all. I've done one of these videos once a week since I've started this job. I do a lot of video work. I'm not anti-video. But what I would say to you is this is a different type of connection. It's a different type of audience. And Apple released recently, I think it was last year, their podcast analytics. And they've demonstrated clearly that now podcasts are part of popular culture. This is not minoritarian culture anymore. This is popular culture. But also, and this is the important bit, podcast listeners are part of what Miranda Katz described as, quote, advertisers holy grail, end of quote. What does that mean? Hyper-engaged, supportive, loyal audiences. Now, what makes podcasting remarkable is that listeners stay with the podcast throughout its presentation. They listen to the lot. In video, of course, people go, oh, look, they watch a couple of minutes. Oh, I'm not hugely interested. Back away. You know, we all do that. We see something interesting on Facebook, watch about 30 seconds of it, go, oh, look, that was interesting, and move to the next thing, right? That's video. Podcasting is different. And, you know, the analytics show this. When you've got your listeners, they stay with you throughout the podcast. That's the loyalty. That is incredible. And also, and this is the bit I love, and I'm actually doing some research work on this at the moment, writing a piece on this at the moment, that podcast listeners don't want standardization. Podcast listeners really, I think, are the new punks, and I'm calling them that. They expect, they want experimentation in form and experimentation in, link, in length. They want you to be very DIY. They want you to have a go and try new things and they'll stay with you through those experiments. So you can see how incredibly important this is to academics. And this is a big audience. Now let me just tell you, I've got this data set from last month. So this data set is from last month. Podcast subscriptions on iTunes have now expanded beyond 1 billion. There are more than 1 billion subscriptions on iTunes alone for podcasts. And the number of unique 
monthly podcast listeners is 75 million monthly. Wow. Now, podcasts are engaging gently with the needs and the interests of the listener. Now, video demands attention, there's no doubt about that, but we live in an attention poor age. Also, and this is just from your perspective, podcasts are easier to record than video or vodcasts. Now, I've got this video thing down, I know what I'm doing, I've been working with video since I was 12, and that's a long time ago, so I get video, I know how to work video. But let me tell you, making high quality audio is much easier than video. And if you are, say, talking to people through your podcast, like doing some interviews, as we've done both on video and in audio in our podcast series, if you're talking and interviewing with people, the camera does intimidate people. So it takes a long time. Often you see me doing this live <laughs> for, for these vlogs, but, but it intimidates people and they get a bit scared and a bit nervous and it takes a while to calm everything down to get that high quality content. Whereas if you've simply got a recorder on a desk, it's much less intimidating for people and you get higher quality content from interviewees. So that's something to think about. Also, video demands a lot more of you as a presenter and I'm not going to fudge this or make this up. I do these videos in one take. This is Saturday morning. I either do them on Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings and I do these vlogs in one take. But it takes probably 20 to 30 hours of preparation to be able to do it in one take. And those of you that see me in the gym every morning know that I am on the treadmill with the cards, learning the cards every single morning of my life. Now, if you can't do these videos in one take, and it's very hard to do, then you sort of lose your day because you start and stop, and you start and stop, and you go again, start and stop, start and stop, and you lose, you waste, not you lose, you waste a lot of time if you can't deliver quickly. With audio, there's much more dexterity with editing. So if you make some errors or some mistakes or some missteps, you can edit them with greater ease. So therefore, let's talk about you and podcasts. I'm gonna put, put in place some definitions here and then I'm gonna be really prescriptive about kit. I'm gonna tell you the kit that you should buy if you wanna do this today. There's plenty of op options and opportunities, but if you want to actually get into this quickly and not make a mistake and not waste a lot of money, I'm going to give you the kit to buy today. So yes, a podcast is audio content. A vlog or a vodcast is used to describe video content. Now, audio files can be downloaded or pulled to the listener. So they go, oh, there's a link, click and download and listen to it, but they can also be pushed to the listener via subscription or syndication. So you sign up for a podcast and when the new potty arrives, it magically downloads to your computer or device. So that's great. Now podcasts are bespoke and they're customized. There are millions upon millions of podcasts. You pick any topic and there will be a podcast series on it. And so for academics, this is great. There, there may be five people in Australia who are interested in the work that you're researching, but around the world, there are probably 5,000 of you. And therefore, by recording a podcast, you create new communities, deterritorialized communities that are interested in your content. You make incredible and real and intimate connections through those podcasts. So the word podcast is a portmanteau for, of course, iPod. Remember these little fellas? iPod and broadcasting created podcasting. Podcasts were and are, and this is a decade ago, what was often called disruptive media. I, I don't like that phrase, but in this case it is accurate. So what that meant was podcasts arrived and they disrupted radio. Because all of a sudden people like me just stopped listening to radio. No interest in radio. I can find high quality content on the very specific areas that I'm terribly interested in, downloaded to me in my own time for my convenience. So I simply disconnected from radio, as tens of thousands of people did. So podcasting was a disruptive media form 
for radio, just like, say, YouTube was disruptive for broadcast television, yeah? So this is an individual media. Very, very small topics can get a very, very large audience, and that's incredibly useful for you as a PhD student thinking about dissemination. However small your topic, there will be people around the world who are terribly, terribly interested in it and want to talk to you about it. <laughs> and what's important is once the podcast is produced, particularly early on, just as you're starting, do start to triangulate it around social media. So here's a podcast, put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, put it on LinkedIn so people can listen to it. It is pulled to them. But then they think, oh, this person's interesting, and they say, subscribe to the podcast. But in the early days, the first three or so months, you need to push that content to people so they know it exists. So I'm now going to be pretty prescriptive, and that's why we've got the kit all over my kitchen table. We're now going to be really prescriptive because there are plenty of options for you if you want to create a podcast. You could use your mobile phone to record stuff, but I really wouldn't. Now, if you want to buy kit, that you can use for the next decade, uh, I'm going to tell it to you. Every possible platform or interface I have trialed uh, for the last decade or so, so I've wasted a lot of money trying new things out. Let me tell you what I think you should use. And can I say, I'm not supporting any of these companies. They've never given me a dollar. This is simply the stuff I use and I found it successful. So firstly, the microphone recorder. Without a doubt, move to Zoom. Zoom is a German company and their microphones are absolutely outstanding. The Zoom 2 is great, that's your baseline model, the cheapest, that's fine, that's great. The Zoom 4 is the next one up and the Zoom 4 is great. I use the 6, can I say the BBC also uses the 6, so this is an industry standard microphone. Also the 6 is fantastic too because you can actually take that microphone out and put in a series of new microphones depending on what you are recording. So again, if you're buying one, buy a Zoom recorder. They are fantastic. They use AA batteries. They use the SD card. So it's not going to be a redundant platform anytime soon. Boom. Okay, for, for editing, go to again a German firm. Clearly Kraftwerk have had a, a long-term effect on the German sonic media industries. But when you're dealing with software and interface management, go to Acoustica Mix craft acoustica mixcraft fantastic software intuitive straightforward for what you're doing with a podcast you're not recording you know an orchestra you're recording a voice and maybe two or three tracks around it yeah so you don't need a bit of software that's like running a 747 you don't need that you need a good clean bit of kit that will allow you to do it at speed and acoustica mixcraft is that software fantastic and as to hosting Again, an absolute no-brainer. The company that was the first podcatcher and will be the last podcatcher is LibSync, Liberated Syndication, www.libsyn.com, Liberated Syndication. So you simply upload your files to LibSync, they release them to the world via their interface and automatically populate iTunes for you. They also have some lovely embed codes. So you can cut and paste code, put it onto your website, put it on, say, your staff page, use it in teaching. So very beautiful bit of interface. We have almost got like this automated player where you can click it. It's lovely. So very, very good firm. And look, that's it. You've got yourself a recorder. You've got yourself some software. You've got yourself a pod, pod catcher. Maybe you want to get yourself a pop screen. Pop, pop which stops the sound coming through, pop, pop. That costs 10 bucks. When you've got all of that, thanks for playing. You're good to go. Now, that means that's the form, okay? If you've got all of that in place, we can now focus on content. So what are you going to do in the podcast? What sort of content is going to enable your career, your writing career, your professional career, your research career, your profile? Now, the stuff I'm going to talk about now is useful for a PhD student. So I'm framing it in this way, but it's great for early career researchers and fantastic for basically all of us, all academics everywhere. So here are 10 quick things you can do in and with a podcast today. One. When you're delivering a public lecture, 
or a seminar or an event in that way, record that event before or after it. So there actually is a digital record of an analog event. So say you're at a conference and eight people hear you speak. That might be great for you. I, I don't find that a good use of time, but that, that's your call. But say you've got that analog content, then record it digitally and put it into a podcast. And then this analog event has a digital life that will extend for years, nay, decades. And new people will hear that content. So incredibly useful technique that, try it. Two, again, great one. I think this is my phrase and genre too. Micro interviews. So say you've got a great colleague, a friend, or a senior colleague, and you ask one question, and they give you one answer. So under two minutes of content, a micro interview. That's great, can I say, to use in teaching. So in a lecture theater, you can bring in a new voice. In a learning management system, you can base a discussion around a micro interview question, sonic content, and also, of course, for research. So if you're trying to introduce a new concept, a micro interview is a great way to do it, okay? And again, remember, podcasts are great for that diversity of content. 40 seconds, a minute, two minutes, two hours. You can do the lot. Three, great one, podcast the PhD journey. I think again, I think I'm the first person to do this in the world as well. So it is weird and fabulous to share this with you. So you can do this either with your supervisor or on your own. So a weekly or fortnightly podcast that tracks your journey through the candidature. You'll get an incredibly loyal audience that way that follow you through your journey. And also you'll get real time feedback where people talk to you about your research and other things you could be doing. Particularly if you say post it on Facebook amongst your friends, they will offer you real time feedback. Now, some of my students have done this. Anne McLeod, hi Anne. Um, Anne McLeod we think is the first PhD student in the world that's podcasted the entire journey. So I think from like the first meeting. So I think Anne, we're at podcast 58. So we'll podcast right through till the thesis comes back. She's about to submit the thesis comes back. We talk about the examiner's reports. So she has thousands of people that have followed her PhD journey and a very inspirational woman she is too. Also, we podcasted through the late great Mick Winters thesis. Uh, and that was incredibly important in ways, of course, we didn't know when he was alive. Uh, because then we were able to use those podcasts in his thesis to demonstrate to the examiners research integrity. That this was his work and listen to these. How many did we have? I think we're in the 40s. 40 something podcasts so you can actually hear Mick's voice talking through how he's developed this research. So there was no sense, even in a posthumous thesis, that this wasn't mixed work, powerful. And also the great Mark Brown, my other wonderful PhD student, looking at artifacts and exegeses, and we've used the podcasts as part of his suite of materials in the artifact to scaffold his DIY tech development. Good on you, Mark. Four. You can promote your article. Wow, I recommend this. So when an article comes out, Talk about it, tell the tale, tell the story of the research, explain to people what the research is about. So these podcasts are great because they provide that context around your research and new dissemination strategies for your research going forward. Incredibly important there. Five, oh, I love this one, podcasts from the field. So this is for our social scientists and our scientists out there doing field work. This is a great way to capture your experiences in the field and reflect upon them in real time. And again, this material can then be cited and used in your thesis as here is the field work sonic or audio diary that people can hear in real time something that's happening and your reflection on it. And then your meta reflection occurs in the thesis itself. Incredibly important that. Haven't seen enough work on that area yet in the refereed literature, but that's big podcasting and field work, huge. Six, this is how I originally got into sonic media actually, capture and disseminate high theory or abstract ideas. This comes from the Open University who transformed how we think about education, particularly in the 1970s. And when they were delivering their distance education materials, 
when stuff was tough, so the really complicated material, they would release it on audio cassette alone because they argued for the abstract ideas, sound worked best. So it could again settle or nest in somebody's life and they could reflect upon those really complicated ideas in a different way to just that visual saturation. And I've used that principle and idea throughout my teaching and learning career as well and I found it to be accurate. Seven, oh yeah, talk through an argument before you write it. This is big. Now, Steve was the master of this, can I say? I'm not sure I would have thought of this on my own. But Steve, in the December, January of 2015, 16, we were on annual leave around Christmas, and he said, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna write this new book called Theoretical Times. I've got the phrase, I think I know what I'm gonna do, but can we record podcasts on 12 topics to just see if anything's there. So we worked through what the 12 topics would be. I wrote questions for each of those 12 and we recorded one podcast a day. Some of our podcast listeners might remember this. So I recorded it, I edited it, we loaded it up and he got real time feedback via Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook overnight for our colleagues in North America and in Europe. So this went on for 12 days. And so by the end of the 12 days, he had all this content to listen to while he was writing the chapters and all this real-time feedback about other areas he could consider. So how fantastic is that in terms of a way to write a book? I would never have thought of that. And can I say those podcasts are still in the top 20 of our podcasts that are downloaded every single month. And what I would also say is by us using the phrase theoretical times, connected to Steve Redhead, by the time the book was published, there was a big audience there, his author platform was secure, that linked his name with the Theoretical Times Project. So the podcast built the author platform for the book, huge. Eight, great one for you, for you. Interview leaders in your field. So when you go somewhere, when you go to a conference, when you go to a symposium or an event, Send an email to the big name person a week or so before that event and ask them if you could borrow their time for half an hour or an hour and do an interview with them about their new publication, their new article, their new book, something new. And you'll be amazed how often people say yes. When I go to a conference, obviously I do a lot of media, that's the broadcast mainstream media, but I also always try and make time for the PhD student to do a video with me, do a podcast with me, do something for their blog. So don't think you're asking a keynote to do something strange here. Ask, and that person will then know you, and they'll remember you as, oh, Michael, you're the guy I did that podcast with. You then gain a profile by your podcast working with this person. So always just ask, and you'll be amazed how often they say yes. Nine, big one, we've done this as part of the Office of Graduate Research, record a seminar on a key article, a key new idea, a key new book. So get your mates together, get the lab together, get the crew together, all read this article or this book or this new idea and have a discussion about it and record it record that seminar and then that shows you and your mates and your friends and your colleagues are at the cutting edge of knowledge and that podcast will move as that new idea moves. So you'll gain profile and traction through it as well. 10, biggie, configure new audiences for your content. Configure new audiences for your content. So at best, podcasts have a translation function. So they take your research and they translate it for new audiences that may not have found that article. So this is particularly important in health and education, no doubt about it, but it's important for all of us. You need to work at linking this high quality research with an audience. You've got to do that work and the podcast is a great translation mechanism to do that. They're great for that translation work. Here's the article, here's why it matters to you. So as you can see, podcasts create connections. They create bridges for you. So you've got my 10 modes of content that you could record today. 
but I wanted to finish off I wanted to finish off by asking the provocative meta question why you should be doing this at this point of your career why now now I often describe social media particularly for academics as a funnel I really use this metaphor all the time because all the material you create goes into a funnel. So you want dissemination of your research, you pump all this stuff through your funnel. Now how I configure that model is I make sure I've got a lot of freely available content that creates the top of my funnel. So plenty of stuff that is available that is free for anybody who would like to listen to interesting content. So podcasts are great because they create that intimacy, that connection with listeners who again are very, very loyal. And then of course that can feed into your premium content that we'll talk about in a second. By the way, this has often been called a freemium model team. So the bulk of your staff podcasts and blogs and open access material, all of that is free and that free leads into premium content that is paid for at the base. Now, as I said, I have an incredibly wide funnel at the top. The overwhelming majority of my academic content is free. That's my politics. I try and work as an organic intellectual. So if you're interested in this work, then just about all my articles are open access. My journalism is open access, podcast videos. It's all available to you, hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours of content if you would like to engage with it. But the argument is all my free stuff funnels into the books. So the books are the page content. If you would like an immersive experience where I'm pulling a lot of ideas together in a considered way, then that's the book and that's what you pay for. Now, most of our academic stuff is free and you decide which bit of your career you want to monetize, you want to make money from. And can I say from sort of 20 years of this type of model, my book career is now changing. So for 20 years, just getting my 20th book out, it's been academic publishing. I'm now starting to get requests for trade books and that will change the modeling again. So still, even with the trade books, the funnel will be wide at the top. The free stuff will be there funneling into the paid content. So if you want that immersive experience of, say, a book, then that's the bit that you pay for. So I want you to think about your social media funnel. What does your funnel look like? What's the free stuff? And what is going to be your premium content? And you need to start thinking through that right now. So will your premium content be books? Will it be consultancies? Will it be public speeches? So Roz, consultancies, clearly that's your paid content. Todd, you've probably got a great speaking career in front of you. That's gonna be your premium content. And that material, the free content, creates that authentic, real relationship with an audience and it builds that audience. This is not marketing, this is not fake. These are authentic, real relationships with people who care about ideas. Remember, academics, as I always say, we are paid from the public purse and we have a public responsibility to develop interesting, innovative ideas that lots of people may disagree with, that's great, but the argument, the debate, the discussion is the foundation of citizenship. That's what we're doing. So podcasts are an evocative, intimate and intelligent medium to build your author platform. So I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out with the funnel.